State of the Union with John King, CNN Sunday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern. It was just weeks ago that Republican Judd Gregg was eager to join the Obama economic team, but then came a dramatic reversal. And since deciding against joining the Democratic administration as Commerce Secretary, Senator Gregg has emerged as one of the president's toughest critics. And his voice matters. He's the senior Republican on the Senate Budget Committee, where there is bipartisan talk that Mr. Obama needs to scale back his ambitious spending plans. Senator Gregg is back home in New Hampshire this weekend, and he joins us from Manchester. Senator, good to see you on State of the Union. Let me start. Thank you for me on, John. Let me start with the AIG bonus debate. You know what happened in the House last week, a punitive tax on those who accepted those bonuses. The debate now moves to the Senate, where some say, let's make it even broader. Let's look at people at Fannie and Freddie who accepted these bonuses. You think this is a bad idea. Why? Absolutely. It's an abuse of the tax law. You know, the taxing authority of the United States is our most powerful weapon. Uh, you know, the reason we separated from England was because the British were using it abusively. And we as a Congress, in reaction to something that is outrageous, the AIG bonuses, should not uh, adulterate the system of taxation in this country. We shouldn't use it in a penal and, and personal way. Uh, it's really overstepping the, the appropriate use of taxing authority. And it, and it leads to a very slippery slope. I mean, where does that stop? When does the, what happens if the majority becomes upset with somebody else in the community of our nation and decides to tax them punitively? Uh, and what happens uh, to the ability of the government to go out and get participants in this financial effort to table, stabilize the financial system? It's going to be very hard, I suspect, to get the private sector to participate with the government if the pri members of the private sector fear that by joining with the government and trying to stabilize the financial system, they're going to end up with, with per potentially a personal and a punitive tax. It's, it's really an abuse of the power by the Congress, in my opinion, to use the tax with in authority in this way. There are other ways to get these bonus, get back to the, on the issue of how you recover these bonuses. I'm sure uh, using the legal authority that we have rather than the excessive weapon of the tax authority. Well, I want to show you one of the front pages of your morning newspapers in New Hampshire, the Valley News here, AIG outrage testing Obama. And I show you this headline, Senator, because I want to ask the question, you know, as we were all covering the story last week, at the beginning of the week, the president says he's outraged, wants to do something about it. Then by the end of the week, we learned that the language protecting those bonuses was put in the stimulus bill at the insistence of the Obama Treasury Department. Is that double speak, or what word would you use for that? Well, we don't know who did what to whom, and hopefully we'll find that out. And I know you as a good investigative reporter and your team will probably get to the bottom of this. Uh, clearly something happened that wasn't a good decision, which was that they did not discipline the AIG bonus structure, and they had the authority at Treasury to do that. Both administrations had that authority, but more of the issue really arises in the last few weeks. And so something should have happened, it didn't happen, and these bonuses were paid. People are disgusted and outraged as they should be, but let's not overreact in a way that basically has the Congress grabbing its pitchforks and charging up the hill and abusing what is a core authority of a government, which is the authority to tax its people. Let me switch from pitchforks to baseball bats. When <laughs> President Obama announced his economic team just after the election, you said this of Larry Summers and Tim Geithner, now a top economic advisor and the Treasury Secretary. You said he's basically signed up Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz. They're extraordinarily strong nominees. As a fellow Red Sox fan, that's the gold standard, although sometimes Manny being Manny can get in the way. But yeah, we Manny him. Ramirez and David Ortiz, <laughs> do you still feel that way? And do you think Tim Geithner, there are some Republicans, your fellow Republicans say it's time for him to go. You agree? No. No, I, I, I do think that in the area of trying to stabilize the financial sector of our economy, uh, they're doing the right things. Uh, they haven't done it as definitively as they should have, clearly. We would have liked a plan that was more definitive earlier, uh, but they are moving in the right direction, and the Fed is moving in the right direction. You've got to remember, we're not going to get out of this recession unless we have credit available to the American people at a reasonable price and reasonably, uh, reasonably easily available. Uh, and you can't have that unless you have a financial system that's working. Uh, and so we've had to make these really difficult but significant efforts to try to get the financial system stabilized. And, and they've gone down the right route in that area. So I, I don't have any problem with the initiatives they've pursued in this area. I do have problems with the budget. I do have problems with the stimulus package. But in the area of defending the financial structure and trying to get it stabilized, I think they're taking the right course of action. I wish it had been more definitive, more specific earlier. 
uh, but they're on the right course. Let's move to the budget and your concerns. You just heard Dr. Romer, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. She's not ready to give yet, but I know on your committee, the budget committee, you look at these new congressional projections and say, sorry, Mr. President, the math doesn't add up. What does the president <clears throat> have to give from his agenda, whether it be health care, education, the environment? What has to give to meet your bottom line? Well, first, I think your listeners have to understand how staggering the numbers are. We're talking about a deficit in the trillion dollar range for as far as the eye can see. We're talking about deficits which are four to five percent of GDP, which is not sustainable under any form of government. We're talking about a public debt. This is the debt that people own of the federal government that will be around 80 percent of GDP. Historically, it's been around 40 percent of GDP in the out years. The practical implications of this is bankruptcy for the United States. There's no other way around it. If we, if we maintain the proposals which are in this budget, over the 10-year period that, our, that this budget covers, this country will go bankrupt. People will not buy our debt. Our dollar will become devalued. It is a very severe situation. And I find it almost unconscionable that this administration is essentially saying, well, we're just going to blithely go along on this course of action after they're getting these numbers, which show that they're not, they're not sustainable. And they know they're not sustainable. Uh, the way I've described it is as if you were flying an airplane and the gas light came on, said you got 15 minutes of gas left, and the pilot said, ah, we're not going to worry about that, we're going to fly for another two hours. Well, the plane crashes, and our country will crash, and we'll pass on to our kids a country that's not affordable. That's not fair to our kids. No generation should do this to another generation. That's what this comes down to. The president keeps talking about how he doesn't want to pass the problems on the next generation. What he's guaranteeing here in his budget structure are problems which our children aren't going to be able to survive with. They're just basically not going to be able to pay the price of the cost of the government. Well, and it is primarily a spending issue. The, the proposal in this budget is to take federal spending up to 23 percent of gross national product and keep it there. Uh, well, historically, gross national product spending in this country has been about 20 percent of GDP of the federal government. It's been taking about 20 percent of gross national product. When you take it up 3 percent, it doesn't sound like much, but it calculates into massive deficits and massive debt. Uh, where it, the budget is proposed doubles the debt in five years, triples it in ten years, and basically puts this country in an untenable position. So we've got to go back and we've got to reorganize. And what I've said and what Senator Conrad has said and what others in the Senate have been willing to say, let's go back, rethink this in a bipartisan way, let's take a look at where the real spending is, which is in the entitlement accounts, and figure out how we get them under control and get their growth rates into something we can tolerate uh, so that we do pass on to our kids an affordable government. Senator, let me ask you, lastly, we're out of time, but when you decided not to take the Commerce Secretary job and to remain in the Senate, you also said you would not seek re-election in 2010. Any second thoughts about that decision? No, 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 absolutely not. Uh, gee, you know, I do hope we can make some gr great strides here before uh, my term is up in the area of bipartisan effort on, con on entitlement reform along the lines of what Ken Conrad and I have proposed, but no, I don't have second thoughts about that.